Okay guys, I'm making this tutorial to recap what we did in After Effects in the last few days and I'm going to take you through the whole process of compositing exercise 1. But I'm going to do this really quickly, so if I go too fast, obviously just pause the video and go back. Alright, so the first thing we have to do is open up our sequences. So this is a brand new project, so what you can start by just double clicking in your project window and going to each folder and manually go to each one, doing like exhaust, click on the first sequence, if OpenEXR sequence is checked, you can click Import. Do not select all of them, otherwise After Effects will treat them all as an individual file. We don't want that, we just want one of these. doesn't matter which one you do, uh, so long as it's the same sequence. And just click Import, and it'll import them as a sequence. Double click the project window again. Go back, let's do Sky, and import this one. Okay. Uh, let's go back again, let's do plane. Now plane has multiple folders. The, or if, if you set this up properly, you should have separate folders per pass. So we have AO, GI, lighting, blah, 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 the rest. The one down here is your master layer, your beauty layer, where it has all your passes combined except for AO. That will not be combined in this one. Okay, so just click on the first one, okay. Now in order to select all of these at once, I'm actually gonna copy this extension up here, open up Windows Explorer grab all of these folders, just drag them in, close that. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is interpret the footage. So let's click on the first one, go to interpret footage, main. Uh, by default, uh, After Effects will import these at 30, so you need to change this to 24. Go up to color management and do interpret linear light or interpret as linear light as on. This is not important if you've already rendered 32-bit EXRs, but in the future we probably will stick to rendering 16-bit EXRs because it'll give us enough range of value to work with, but After Effects won't handle them properly if this is not turned on. Okay, and then everything else looks good, and I click OK. Then we want to right-click over the same one to interpret footage again, but this time we're going to do Remember Interpretation. Click that, then select all the other ones, right-click, and apply interpretation. Now they're all going to be the same. All right, so I can click any one of these, and I know I'm using 200 frames, so you can either click and drag this into a new composition, and then you'll get that that uh, that layer added to your composition with that same name, but it's the right length, or we can just click on this little comp button, create new comp. You can just leave it at comp one for now. Make sure your frame rate is 24 FPS. Your height is 1920 by 1080. Everything else should be unchanged. Your duration, just count how many frames you have and just type that in. So if you need to go back to your Explorer window, just like select all of these frames. You get 200 there. And then 200 will show up down here too. Okay. Click OK. First thing that we need to do, you can also go on D2L and refer to that document that I have, the um, V-Ray help document that shows you the layer orders, but uh, I'll just show you how to do this. Right, so the first one is going to be GI. Slap that down in there. And uh, before I forget, we need to actually set up our, our color management properly, and you might see a, a slight change here. So click on where it says show, show channel and color management settings down here. It's a little RGB, all the circles combined. Click that. Do set working space. We're going to be using 32 bits per channel. Our working space is going to be sRGB, not eSRGB, this one, that. And then the important step here is linearize working space, otherwise you're not going to get correct colors. And then click OK. Next thing, I'm going to grab lighting. And I'm going to actually, I'll expand this out so you can see the names of these things. I'm also going to use my toggle switches modes on the same layer. So I'm just going to right click at the top, do columns, and make sure that switches and modes are both selected. Click that, now my modes that they are on the same line, so I don't have to keep toggling back and forth. Okay, so there, our modes are our blending modes, so our lighting needs to be added. It goes on top of this. And then the next thing would probably be our AO. This is what your AO should look like. If it's really, really dark, you'll need to adjust that with the curves. And I'm going to multiply my AO. And right at the very beginning when you multiply your AO, click T to bring up your opacity controls and change it to 50. You really shouldn't go above 50 most of the time. Depends how thin your lines are, but most of the time 50 is enough. All right, next things. Now these don't particularly matter for order, so I'm just gonna 
grab the reflection next. I'll do that one. It's what your reflection should look like if it has some roughness to it. That's what it should look like. Go to click add. I'm going to grab our reflection glossiness is going to look something like this. If you have one of these mats, you don't actually composite directly with this. You use this as a mat to be able to control your reflection, your reflection pass, or do something else with it. So I thought we were going to like explore what we could do with this, but uh, we kind of ran out of time. So alas, you can just leave it there. If you have any lights that light up, self-illumination would be important. If, if I scroll around oops, to the end, I have a little tiny light there. That's what that was for. Just click add, add that on. Oh, that's for my reflection glossiness. You know what? I'm just going to delete the reflection glossiness. Get rid of that. I want my self-illumination to be added. All right, next refraction. This is going to be our glass. And again, since all of these are additive, it does not matter the order that they go in because they're just being added on top of each other. Uh, specular, add that in. Actually, I kind of like my specular, you know, above the lighting. Kind of makes sense to put it there. If I move back over here, you can see what the specularity is doing. It's just these hot spots, highlights. Just have to add. Don't forget about the solo button. This allows you to isolate that single layer, like in Maya, and you can isolate the selection. Works in the same way. Okay. Uh, what else? What am I forgetting? We got uh, oh, it's Z depth. We're gonna print that in. Now we're not gonna co composite directly with this one either, but uh, put your Z depth at the top for now. Oh, and by the way, your effects controls. We're just about to start using these. Usually they're here. It's here in this window, so you might have to pull this out a little bit to get back to where your project is, your project panel. So click on where it says effects controls, click and drag, and then just snap it to the side. Click and drag, snap it here, snap it here, doesn't really matter. But that allows you to see your project window and after effects controls at the same time. All right, another thing that you're gonna need, go to window, make sure that effects and presets is checked. And come over here, and we're gonna type in curves. We're gonna grab a curves adjustment, slap that in. You can click and drag or you can double click it or you can click it dra and drag it directly to the layer. Okay, Our Z depth should have an, a, quite a bit of contrast in it depending on the size of your plane. Mine is probably okay as it is but I'm just gonna add a little bit of contrast. I'm gonna pull this down in the lower midtones and shadowed area and then pull my highlights back up just a little bit. Looks something like this. Kinda like that. That will do. Uh, but the important thing is here you need to kind of scrub through this and see how much your Z depth changes. I'm just solo this. So let's say around like 140 ish, it seems to not really change anymore. But then when I go backwards, I can see that it's getting lighter and lighter and lighter. And around frame zero, the Z depth is, is almost completely lost. It's, it's almost white. Okay? So what we need to do is add another curves to control the brightness as it animates. We're going to animate this curves here. So to change the name of this, we're going to click the enter key and we're just type, going to type an animated correction or something just so we remember what this was specifically for. And then on the frame that it doesn't change, like around here it's beginning to be more consistent, I'm going to click the stopwatch here. Okay, that sets a keyframe. In order to see the keyframe, you can click the U key, it's in uniform. I'm going to pull backwards. And the idea is we need to change this curve so it matches more closely what it did at the end here. So we can see the values. And as we scrub backwards, it's a little bit a little bit too bright at the back. I'm going to kind of pull those curves down. Try to keep it a smooth curve. But something like that is going to be a little bit more consistent as you scrub through it. And as you scrub through it, you can see the curves is changing. Now one important thing about animating curves is that you have to have you have to start at one keyframe and end at another keyframe. You can't try to fix the curve in the middle of an interpretate like an interpolation like between two because you you don't have your points anymore. We had two points previously and it's quite easy to manipulate. But when you just get this pencil tool it's extremely difficult. It's really hard and you just kind of mess stuff up. Okay, right. So that's that. We can minimize that now. And we can actually turn this layer off. Okay, so next thing, I'm actually just going to save this really quickly. Okay. Uh, next thing. I don't think I ever dropped my sky in here. Let me do that really fast. 
pull this all the way to the bottom. Now we can actually see our sky in there. Kind of everything's looking very, very washed out right now. We're gonna do some color correction a little bit later on, and that will give it a lot more contrast. But for now, let's do the, the depth. Okay, so for depth to work properly, we're going to have to put a camera lens blur node on every single layer to get this to work properly. And uh, I think I explained this in class, but I'm not going to explain it again here. So what we're going to do is just make a background layer for our Z-depth. So we're going to just type this in, call it like Z-depth, whoops, Z-depth background. Let's make it white. Click on the color, make it 100% white. Click OK. All right, so looking at these two layers, the idea here is to make it look like the plane is kind of coming through mist. So on mine, uh, if your plane is really white here, then this will be fine. If not, uh, you can either go back up to your solid settings by going up to layer solid settings and then grabbing the eyedropper tool and just sampling a region at the very end of your plane like that. or you can always add a fill effect. This allows you a little bit easier control. Click on the eyedropper and then click the last part of your plane. This will give you a little bit easier results, less harsh, because what we're going to be using is uh, we're going to be using a combination of this background and this map right here to control where is blurry and where is not blurry. But in order to do that, we need to color in the background. Otherwise, After Effects is going to go, all right, I'll blur the plane, but where it's black, I'm not going to even touch it, but that's not going to be realistic. And to be honest, this effect, this way of cheating this effect is not very good in After Effects. It's, it's kind of a subpar implementation of how this should work, uh, but uh, we just have to work with what we got. All right, so select both of these layers, right click and do pre-compose or do control shift C. I'm going to type in Z depth combined, just so we remember. And we can actually turn that off, unsolo it, and turn off the visibility. And then we're going to do layer, new, adjustment layer. And we just type in, and I just clicked enter on the keyboard, just like we did with the effect. You can also right click and do rename, but if you just click the enter key, you can rename it that way as well. DOF e at the field. And I'm actually going to have two depth of fields. Um, so I'm going to have one as an adjustment layer, the other one's going to be a null. So this one I'm going to actually call uh, DOF, I'll just do like a base. Okay, so the way this effect works is it's going to, or the way we're going to use it in a second, is going to look at this. Areas that are black are going to have less blur, areas that are white are going to have more blur. We can always go in and change the contrast of this so it's a little bit more contrasty. But it's always going to have a part which, which is not that blurred. So I want to add a base blur to the entire thing. So it's something very, very subtle, but nothing in the camera is going to be that sharp. So we're going to type in camera, or camera lens blur, and this is the effect camera lens blur, drag it over. So right away, everything goes blurry because we're at a 5% radius. That's quite high, but this is what it's doing. It's giving me that kind of bokeh effect, which is quite good. But what we need is something really subtle like one, potentially lower than that, but I think one right now is all right. We can, we can probably work with that. We might even go to 0.5 since we're going to be adding blur on top of this anyway. Okay, so the next part's a little bit confusing, but we're going to do new layer, null object. Okay, so this is going to be our master control for all of our depth of field. So I'm going to type in DOF master. Next thing, I'm going to gr grab a camera lens blur, another one, place it on this DOF layer. And then I'm going to pick, pick the next layer below it and add another one on that one. Okay, so on the DOF layer, I'm going to click E, and the layer underneath, I'm going to click E. You should see camera lens blur in both. Open up both of these, and we're going to open up the blur map, and we're going to open up the blur map on this one too. And what we're going to do, we're going to link these effects here, these channels, this blur radius channel and the, and the uh, blur focal distance channel. We will link that to this one. So instead of having to go through every single layer and control them each individually, we're just going to do it with this one null object. And a null object is kind of like a locator in Maya. It's not, uh, it doesn't actually affect anything. It's not really visible. It's just there so you can put things on it and attach things to it, basically. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is uh, repeat edge pixels. We're going to want that on. And uh, we're going to want that on in the other one as well. We could link these, but that's something you should always have anyway. Link those. And uh, on the blur map where it says non, 
on under layer. We're going to do depth Z depth combined. Okay, so nothing's going to happen right now because nothing's being attached. But uh, what we're going to do on the the layer underneath. So this is on the reflect uh, refract layer. We're going to hold down the Alt key and then click on the stopwatch for a blur radius. This is going to create an expression. Next thing, we're going to click the pick whip, pull this up and attach it to the blur radius of the DOF master layer. So not the layer itself, but just this channel of the layer. And let go, and you should see text like that. Click the numpad enter, so not the, the main enter, the enter on the very right hand side of your keyboard. Click that one. If you do the other enter, you'll enter a line instead of actually closing out of it. Okay, and now we're going to do the same thing, but with the blur focal distance, but I'm going to have to enable this one to also use the same Z depth map something you can't control otherwise you have to enable some map first alt click on blur focal distance click on that grab the pick whip pull it up and attach it to the blur focal distance of your master layer click OK or just click enter sorry the numpad enter we can close this now or well, actually you know what? I'm gonna keep that open just so I can show you what's what's gonna happen camera lens blur so up here in our master layer, you can see that this value is now being shown as red in the layer below. And then the same thing for the blur focal distance is also red. Anything that's red means it's being driven by an expression. And in this case, we attach these values to these values. So if I go to my master control and turn the radius completely off to zero, this updates here. And if I wanted to change my focal distance and scrub through some values there, it changes it there. This is the entire point of doing this, okay? Right. So now, what we need on the layer that has the expression, uh, on the layer that has the expressions, just grab those. Click on the effect. Click Control C to copy it. Close that down. Then go through each layer underneath, and just paste it in this window. So, paste. Click on the next one. You have to click the layer. Click paste, 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 paste. And we're also going to do it for our sky as well. Okay. Next. We can actually control some of this. So let's uh, type in five on our master layer. So let's increase that a little bit so you can see what it's doing. So if you increase this like a crazy amount, you can see how it's trying to read the map, but it's not doing a particularly good job of it. You still get ed edge fringing, and this is so high it's taking forever to render. We're not going to go above a value of around five-ish. Um, it's quite blurry in the background there. It looks alright actually on, on the screen. It looks okay. Uh, but we might scrub forward and just see what it looks like in, in other views. Especially if you have text on it. It's a good indicator of how blurry something is. It actually looks pretty good. I think in class I used some different values, but looking at this differently and I think, I think this looks okay. Okay. Alright, so we have our DOF base. It's on 0.5. I could even go, could even go to 1 on that as well. Get slightly more blurry. Okay, so this is our. This is how you set up your depth of field, right? Okay, and if I wanted to, I could. If I lock this composition, click the lock button up here, double click on the Z depth, and just pull this to a new window, so I can have a look and control my Z depth and see the, the main comp at the same time. I can create an adjustment layer. We call this like a color correction as well. CC for color correction. Don't need these soloed curves and I could begin to affect the Z depth as well so not a lot is showing up there I could, I could, I could make this entire thing brighter if I wanted to the brighter it is the more blurry this is going to be so I could just to really clarify what this is doing I could blow this entire thing out and then you should see it gets super blurry here yeah so that's, that would be a terrible Z depth map, but if you wanted to play around with your values, that would be how you would do it. Just it's a pretty good, pretty good method. Although down here, you're kind of losing out of some of that that gradient. It's it's not really as as we progress through here, it's getting less and less like the the end of the the plane, especially when you get right here. The plane kind of sticks out from the background. I mean, it's all, it's all right. It doesn't particularly matter. Uh, if you wanted to, you could go into your Z depth background and animate this color as well, just by sampling a color here. 
Like for instance, I could say, all right, I think it looks pretty good here. Set a keyframe, go all the way back to the end, and then sample on a color that's a little bit closer. Something right there. Oh, actually, you know what? I'm going to have to turn off my color correction before I do that, and then do that. There we go. So then the color of the background will change slightly as well, if you want to. I mean, it's whatever looks all right. Okay, so that's one way of controlling your z-depth. It's not probably not the best way of doing it, but whatever. All right, so I'm going to close that. All right, next thing, let's do some color correction. So the very we need to step back into our main comp, and uh, you can put color correction on every single node depending on what adjustments you need to make. Like for instance, if the lighting wasn't wasn't bright enough, you could increase the brightness of it. You can increase the color of that. You shouldn't just arbitrarily increase your values though, because you're going to get into uh, clipping, obviously. But uh, you can do it that way. It's not the not the best way, especially when you start working with actual plates. Uh, we're going to create a new adjustment layer and I just right clicked in this blank area or you can go up to layer new adjustment layer. On this one I'm going to call this color correction. I'm actually going to put this all the way at the very top. Okay on color correction grab a curves adjustment and the first one is going to be a, just a contrast curves and uh, I, actually you know what I'm going to grab a a tint effect as well. Grab a tint effect. You can put this on a different layer if you want, but for now I'm just going to put it here. It's on the same one. So we're just looking at the black and white values with tint. And then at the end we can just turn this off and, and see our colors again. I'm going to crush these values down here quite a bit. Now this HDR is awful. It's not really a, a good HDR. An HDR should give you a lot, lot of uh, colors to choose from, and there's already banding in here. That's a pretty poor HDR, but uh, in terms of the actual quality of the pixels. So something like that, we're probably going to be okay. Let's pull this forward a little bit. You have to go to d various frames and just have a look. Uh, that's blowing out. If you have your info selected up here, you just hover your mouse over it. You can see that these values are going above one, which means they're clipping. This value is going above one. Quite bright, and this one quite bright and these are quite dark actually but whatever we'll fix that in a minute now uh, this is actually quite dark too now the, the ways to fix this would actually be put a, a little point light inside on a really really low value or just go into your texture and just brighten it up don't make it black but uh, the light would help or I mean I mean when you actually have an actual camera and you shoot something you're probably gonna get darker values you could also just render out a uh, uh, a mat just of this section so you could control it individually later but for this exercise it doesn't really matter so um, this contrast is, is okay it's alright let's go back to the beginning we are getting a, almost a little bit of clipping here but I don't want to increase these values too much you could maybe just add a little bit more to the highlights there remember this these are your highlights this region is going to be your shadowed area so something kinda like this Gotta look okay. Okay. Next, let's do color. So I'm gonna turn off the tint effect, and you can see these are these are quite uh, quite, quite bright. I right, add another curves. So this is just gonna control our main contrast. The other ones are gonna be for color. Pull this in, and if you go up to your channel, you can change your channel to red, for instance. And I can just add a little bit of red into this, just a tad, kind of around there. Um, that's really, really bright right now. We'll go back to the spec layer in a minute, or the direct lighting layer. But probably around here is a better way to have a look at these colors. This kind of looks like it's sunset or whatever. Looks all right. Okay, and then I could add some blue into this as well, or rather reduce the blue just a tad. Kinda like pull this down. Pull this back up. Kind of like that. That would. Looks all right. Something kind of like that. Uh, there's also if you go into just delete this and go up to color correction. There's a ton of different effects. So have a play around with the curves. Though is probably going to be the main one or levels. If you're a levels person, you can do that. Okay. All right. So that's that. Let's go into our. Let's fix these highlight issues. So if you go to our specularity and just turn this layer off, 
can see that it's causing some of these specular highlights, especially this one right there. And if we go back to the front, there's, I think there's a highlight around the front side of this, which is very, very, very bright. Let's pull this around. Yeah, this is this is clipping. Some of your values, by the way, I was looking at them, they have like super high, like this goes to like a 10 or something. You're absolutely going to have to grab a curves adjustment. This, So you can grab it, you can get a curves adjustment, pull it in, and by the way, this should be above your your camera lens blur. Camera lens blur should be the, on the bottom, and that indi indicates with effects that uh, effects on the bottom are actually on the top of all your effects. Complete opposite to down here where this layer is actually on top of all the other ones, but After Effects effects work in the opposite way. All right, so where is, where was I? I was on specularity. Okay, let's, uh, you could pull down the highlights there that this way this would also do it but this is a way to tone map it so if you type in uh, HDR it's an HDR compressor so it doesn't clamp your values it actually does a pretty good job at tone mapping them so tone mapping is converting it to a from converting a high dynamic range which is what we have to a low dynamic range or that is a type of tone mapping this is um, it's not going to do it f fully to 8-bit color but it does a much better job of what we had before uh, and it's a little easier to use in the curves, but we could still add a little bit. We could just pull these bright values down just a tad and kind of help some of those values out. Let's move over here. Have a look at this value around here. I was clipping earlier. Okay, let's turn the compressor off. You can see that what that actually does. It does a pretty good job at just reducing those values. This really bright values. I'm not actually happy with this at all, but um, I don't know what is specifically causing that. Same thing with this guy's helmet. And these values just look clipping, but not a lot I can do about that with, rather than going into re-render. So, it's fine. It's fine for this exercise. Okay. Save this again. And uh, I think the last thing to do is exhaust, and then it will be rendering. Okay? So for exhaust, what we're going to do first is I think we did we pull the exhaust down? No, we did not. So let's grab that. And this depends on where your exhaust needs to be. I think it's probably just gonna be above the sky. I think that will work. And for whatever reason, mine didn't line up properly. I can't remember if I did something wrong in After Effects or in, in Maya or, or what. So I'm just gonna click the S key and just scale this up. I have to do 125%. Now it says it's 1080, but I don't I don't know why it's not lining up. Anyway, so it lines up perfectly. Okay, so first thing, we're actually going to use this as a mat. So if I click on the solo button, and then go to toggle layer transparency, you can see this has an alpha. This this is occupying the alpha, the rest is transparent. So we can use the alpha mat to be able to have another layer underneath, only use the space that this kind of wobbly line is occupying. We could also use the luma as well, but it doesn't really matter for this. Let's go to layer, new adjustment layer. And then we can type in heat blur. Unsolo these. And what heat blur is going to do? We're going to look at on our track mat. Again, if you don't have your, if you don't see track mat here, click the button down here that says toggle switches modes. Click that. So heat blur. Click where it says non. We go alpha. Then the actual exhaust will be hidden because it's a mat. It's no longer supposed to be visible. It's like a mask in, in Photoshop. Alright, so I'm going to start by adding a curves to this. Pull the curves in, lower the curves a little bit just so you can see where it is. And then I'm going to go back to the exhaust layer and then I'm going to add a fast blur. So fast blur is now legacy, but whatever. Pull this in, I don't know, like 20. Pull this up. I just want to see how this looks here. I want this to be pretty blurry. 40. That's 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 much better. Uh, always check repeat edge pixels, and this is a specific reason why you don't think you need that. But it's always going to just fix the edges. All right, heat blur. This is already has a little bit of ripples in it, so I think this is going to be dark enough for us. But I want to add a little bit of heat distortion as well, so that the heat distortion effect is going to be turbulent displacement. This one. Pull this over. And there's not a lot to displace in the background. This is all kind of just a like mushy gradient. So this would these settings are probably not going to be the, the same if you had something that's actually refracting, or that's basically what it is for lights refracting through it. And then uh, we're going to increase 
the size to like or decrease it to 10. Uh, complexity. Now let me just uh, let me sh don't do this, but I'm gonna make a new adjustment layer. Just put this over everything, just so I can show you what this does. It makes everything wobbly. So an amount of 10 or a size of 10 rather. Let's the amount of 50. There we go. Gives us little tiny ripples. And then we can increase our complexity to like two or three. Add smaller and smaller ripples. It's kind of cool. We can also animate our evolution. Actually, I'm gonna I'll do this here, and then I'll just copy this effect down. So if you hold down the Alt key over evolution, you type in time with an asterisk for multiplication, and then you just multiply that by a value. So it's how many rotations you want this, how many degrees you want this to rotate per second. So let's do a hundred. I, I have no idea. And then if you just scrub through this a little bit, you can see how that might change. Like page up, page down. I'm just gonna show you some differences. So it's moving a little bit. We could do like times 360, so one full rotation every minute, or every second rather. That's one way of doing it. And I don't want it up here, obviously, so I'm going to click the turbulent displace up here, just cut this down, delete this layer, and paste it over the other one. So you can just do that directly on that layer. These are the important settings. Something like this, and this will this will work. So if you have an engine that's exposed, like or your exhaust is coming out here, you will definitely see that ripple. So you may have to change these settings just so it looks a little bit better. Okay, um, right. So this is actually going to take a little bit of rendering time to do, but this is basically how we composite this. I'm not getting a lot of clipping here. These are pretty good values there. Looks all right. Okay, all right. So let's render. So in order to render H.264, what you're going to have to do is, um, is do edit, or not edit, composition. And we're going to have to send that to the Adobe Media Encoder queue, so if you're doing this at home. But we also have the DNSHD codecs at school, so on the school computers. And I don't even know if I have these installed here. So let's do Control M. Do where it's, click on where it says lossless. Format. QuickTime. Oh yes, okay. DNX HD. This is where we go. This is one of the ways to do it. Um, I'm not entirely certain what the difference is between this one and this one. This is the one I generally choose. If you do choose 1080p DNX HD, H high quality 8-bit, uh, make sure it's 1080p. We don't want interlaced stuff, so just do 1080p. Not standard quality. High quality is fine. Um, I'd have to do some test renders to see what this one is, but. Um, we're going to stick with this one in class for now. Nothing else that you need to do. Obviously, this is no audio. We can't control the bitrate. DNX HD, the codec takes care of it. And click OK. And click OK again. This is output 2, not yet specified. Just go and find a place to put this. So I'm going to put this in my. You should. What you should actually do is in your Maya project folder, make a folder called Previews. And, and just put it there. This is my this is version 28. Put your version number there. Make your naming convention just like this, and click OK. And then you just click the render button. Now the other way to do this, if you don't have DNX HD installed, we're gonna have to go and do this through the media encoder. So you have to go to composition, add to Adobe media encoder queue. So make sure you have this saved. Click that. Control Alt M is the other way to do it. This will open up the media encoder. Sometimes, especially if you're using a school computer, this is going to take a little bit of time to open uh, because it's re-imaged every, every time you open it, so it just takes forever to just initialize it, essentially. Okay, so let's click on where it says H.264. Now, this one has taken... There's, there's two on here. This is a previous one I did. Close that. Open up this. H.264 has to do this dynamic link server connection thing. This usually doesn't take very long to do. Okay, uh, I had a preset selected, but I think I don't know what it does by default. I have no idea how it defaults, but uh, we want to match source is what we want to do. So if that's not checked, match uh, match the source. Uh, width and height should be 1920 by 1080. Frame rate should be 24. If these are not 24. That means something is wrong in After Effects, and you did not set this up properly. Make sure render at maximum depth is checked. Uh, depending on how long you want to wait, a VBR two pass is better, but you can just do one pass if you're short on time. Um, 
a minimum for your maximum value should be 25. I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go below that. But let's make our target like I don't know, 30 or 20. Let's do 20, and then our maximum at 25. That will be fine. Uh, if that is a little bit crappy, like this little preview is for some reason, then it just increase that. I wouldn't go above 50, but uh, 25 should be all right for for our purposes. Uh, use maximum rendered. Uh, quality make sure that is checked uh, and then you don't need any of this stuff it's just the video quality stuff that we need again this could be just one pass this will take twice as long to render because it does two passes but other than that you can just click OK so if you're in the media encoder queue you click this little start button to let it start rendering and this will start going uh, this is going to take quite a while to render for me, do not do not ever render to a flash drive. It's going to take forever. This is going to take like, what, 10, 10 minutes or something. I'm going to stop this. Obviously, don't stop it if you want it to fully render. I'm just going to show you this in After Effects as well. So in After Effects, if you had made your comp down here, you just click the Render button, and then it will start rendering. So After Effects does not have H.264, the ability to render that directly. This is why we have to go through the media encoder. And on your computers at home, and probably and all the school computers, there's not... QuickTime installed anymore because of the security issues with it. So this is why we have to go to the encoder. So if you're in the lab, you should be able to access DNX HD. You can also download it at home. It's free. Let's just type in Avid Codex, and it's the DNX HD collection. Um, they're pretty decent codecs. They are going to be much larger, but they are much better quality. All right, so I hope that helps. Um, please do watch this a few times if you are stuck on a specific area. And uh, obviously email me if you need help. Okay, thank you.